So as part of um, our team's initial planning, um, we stayed true to the Bank Street philosophy, which was really starting from a strength-based um, approach. Um, and we went through the ideal learning principles and, and having programs really think about where they felt um, the strengths in their programs lie around the principles. Once we kind of got through all of those, we moved to areas of growth that they felt um, that they could um, work on. One program I worked with that's doing a Reggio Emilia um, curriculum, um, I really appreciated the, the team saying, you know, we always had a hard time with kind of family buy-in with the curriculum in terms of just explaining, you know, like why this curriculum from Italy, how is that relevant, you know, to our program here in the United States? And as, you know, they started learning more about the ideal learning principles, they realized there's so much in common, but the ideal learning principles offered language that they felt was more accessible. Always when you come from a strength-based perspective, I think it helps build the relationship because people can um, really share what they want with you and what they feel proud of and, um, you know, um, what they what they want to highlight. Um, and that makes it easier than to talk about challenges later on. Our second goal was to support teachers to recognize and implement the principles. So we really wanted to remain strength-based with that and recognize the things that we're already implementing. Um, so these, I think that um, Christina shared that document that we created that's just kind of a running record of each of the principles and how our teaching staff are looking at the principles and kind of doing a reflection piece. So this is just a little snippet of that, but what we're asking them for each principle is how it's already being represented in their work, how the principle can be strengthened and any questions or thoughts or ideas that they have about that. So we went through that with our teaching staff and all of the ideal principles uh, pre-service. And then that document will go out um, a couple of times throughout the year as well, just for everybody to be self-reflective and keeping that, like we've all kind of talked about, keeping it rolling and keeping it active in our work. For some of them, that meant in the course of a coaching session, we might have talked about like two to three principles at a time. And I think breaking it off into parts helped them uh, to be able to really think about, okay, what does this principle mean? Um, and how is it showing up in our program? And they started feeling comfortable by like the second session, like, oh yeah, we understand what that principle means. And this is how it shows up in our program. And I was like, in terms of how it shows up, like what evidence are you saying? Oh yes, we practice equity. How do you practice equity? How do you see it in your classrooms? How do you see it, you know, in, in, in the hallways? Many times I would have conversations because the programs are incredible and they have these big and important goals, right? To to better their programs, um, you know, um, to support families and to support children. But often it would feel like a, a huge mountain. They're like, this is what I wanna do, but I'm sort of drowning in everything else that I have to do. So, you know, part of the work is to, you know, break things down just into smaller, tiny steps. I used to think that educators may not get it. They would think that it's one more task that they have to add to their agenda, but knowing that they can tap into their values and see it within the principles is a better approach for presenting these principles because they have that drive and that joy for caring for children and making those connections are powerful. Doing that deep dive with the leadership team first, mm -hmm. I think helped them to become comfortable with their understanding of the principles and for them to really be honest with themselves about how it 
how the principals were or were not showing up in their programs. I think that over the the course of, of the, the coaching cycle that we engaged in, that when they set their goals, like they were honest in not surface level in what they wanted to work on because they had a, a better understanding of where it was showing, where the principals were showing up um, in their programs. One of my programs, the executive director said, what are you doing with my, with my staff? They have so much more confidence affirming the work that they're doing in you know with with their staff um having someone say you're doing the work right this these are the ideal learning principles this is qual this is what quality early childhood you know care looks like and they're like oh okay so we're comfortable talking about it now to our you know when we go into our classes and we're talking with you know our teachers I liked the, the like sort of tiered system. So at first it was just myself and Patty. We were the leaders on our education department and we shared that with the other department leaders. So we have a health and mental health department. We have an operations department, finance, like all of our departments have it, are aware of it. We've shared it, we've discussed it. Um, so we did that and then we studied it with our education team. So those are our, our coaches. Those are, are the people who are directly supporting and supervising all of our teachers. Christina met with us um, and dove into those principles a couple of times. Uh, and now then we shared it with our teachers. So that like, I, I don't feel like I, I can share something until I have a deep understanding of it myself, you know? So um, me and then sharing it with the next level and the next level, and the next level. Um, I think that that helped everybody know what it is, but also helped me to understand it even more. Very early on, programs realize that they're already doing most of, of what the principles were. Um, this was not something new. This was not something sort of extra or additional that, um, that they were adding to their program. Um, but it was a way to really articulate um, the foundational work that they were already doing. I think the buy-in was um, was quick um, because it was something that they could easily relate to, um, and it allowed them to have some common language around um, fundamental parts of their work um, that they were already doing. I talked to programs about their understanding of the prince of each of the principles first, and ask them how do they think it was showing up in their programs and then um, where they thought that um, there could be room for improvement and growth. Talking about things that staff members, educators are already doing and not feeling like they need to do more. So what we did is we collected pictures because, you know, we do a lot of picture taking in the spaces and we shared with them, like connecting them to the learning principles. So like, these are things that you are already doing in your spaces. Tell me where they would belong and why. So they could get more of a tangible vision of like, they are, it's not more work. <laughs> They're already doing this. It's just framing the language that we talk through with the learning principles and our philosophy and our values in the program. Going through the ideal learning principles took took many weeks. Um, and I think, at least speaking for myself, there was a lot of value in taking that time so that we could build, um, build off of that. I think I would definitely say take it slowly and look at the principles first, like look at the principles first and think about like the low hanging, like you talk about low hanging fruit, the ones that are the easiest to talk about and to have a common understanding of, take them one at a time. Talk about how people see them. Like after you have an understanding of, of each of them, how do they see them in, in their programs? If I had advice for anybody, it's to slow down. It's not to rush it. For me, it's not just a coaching tool. It's a way of being. But people who it isn't their natural inclination to be that way. If you can slow down and have them find one thing in each of the areas that they value about it, then you can start that process of having them to totally embrace it. And I think that's the thing that I found. You get gung-ho as a, as a group and you roll it out really fast because you just want 
want it out there. We want it to stick. We want it to have value in a different way. So I would just say slowing down. We need to keep our educators informed of current practices and we need to keep them in conversation about what should be happening you know, in our programs. And so we have to do the professional learning during the course of their workday. And and that's not an easy pill for, for some families to swallow because they need the childcare. But I think COVID kind of showed us that, you know what, we can't take educators' needs <laughs> for granted that we do have to make time and space for them to be able to learn and to grow and to breathe and to have some time off. So I think that building in professional learning during the school day, quality professional ongoing, job embedded uh, is important. And not just looking at early child, you know, early childhood education as babysitting because it's so much more. Mm -hmm.